Hi everyone, it's Ken Rakowski. Welcome to Metal Mentoring. Every week we take one of the great speakers that we hang out with on Saturdays and spend much more time with them. This week is what's called an audible. Unplanned, unscheduled, but he was there because he's just a great guy. Is Mr. Marco Tempest, who's joining us from Geneva, no, Zurich, Switzerland. Hello, Marco. Hey, how are you doing? I, I, that's your line, by the way. How are you doing? Huh? You actually expect someone to respond to you? Yeah, I said, isn't, isn't that, <laughs> that's what they told me to say when I moved to the U.S. So, <laughs> Marco is from the German side of Switzerland. And uh, Marco, how do you describe yourself to people? I, um, I have a background in technology and magic and I use, I use technology and magic to, um, to prototype the near future. And I help companies bring their technological stories to life. Now, when I met you, you were known as the virtual magician. That was the whole gimmick. You were really the first on YouTube when YouTube came out. Well, actually, before YouTube, you were on all the platforms before that doing magic with your Nokia phone back then, unedited, uncut, and showing people what you could do with just the visuals of a mobile phone. You were really the first to ever do that. Well, right? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I've, I always play with the new technology or you could say emerging technology when something is new and people are not quite sure what it can do or cannot do. That's for me the time to kind of dig into that and play with it. And so back in that time, it was cell phones suddenly were able to record video. And so it was the perfect platform to, to use YouTube and do stuff with a cell phone people would not expect. It was, it was interesting. If you go back, everyone, I think Marco still has it on his channel. And you could watch him do things where he's dropping a cell phone out from his top floor and uh, catching it on the very bottom floor all in a matter of like two seconds. It's a lot of fun on what you see him do. But Marco, times have changed. You are certainly not that same guy that you were back then on what you do today. Tell people what you do today. Uh, these days I, I wear multiple hats. So I, I work for a professional services company for Accenture where I run an innovation lab where we explore augmented and virtual reality and how that might be used in industry. And I'm also a creative technologist at uh, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, where I help teams get funding, tell their story. We, call, we don't call it storytelling, we call it creating compelling mission narratives and uh, kind of um, thinking about the future and where space exploration might take us in the next 10, 50, 100 years. Let's face it, Marco you would never have expected going back 10, 15 years ago, you would ever have two gigs, two full-time gigs, I might add, at the same time in those type of spaces. Yeah, that's true. And uh, yeah, I'm, I could say I'm, I'm just super fortunate that all these things kind of fell in place. I think one thing which led to this was about 10 years ago, I kind of let go of a, of a clear goal, of a clear place I wanted to be. Like, I no longer wanted to have like my own TV show or my own this or that. It was more like I want to continue loving at what I love to do and see where it takes me and kind of be open for serendipity. And um, I think that made all the difference. This kind of, um, you could say, compass versus destination, like know a vector where you want to go and the kind of things which feel right for you rather than having a, a, a target aim at one thing you want to achieve. Well, explain that. Explain. First, you. I know that you did do some TV. I remember you doing a show you shot in Tokyo, in Japan. Uh, I, I know you did. I know, I go back. But I mean, you and I have been together for 15 years. So I know you tried different types of shows. As a matter of fact, you actually won um, in the Masters of Magicians. You won as one of the top magicians. That was a great show. So TV wasn't something that was alien to you. You did do it. You knew it showed audiences what your, your talents were. How did you decide, maybe I shouldn't pursue it? What was that catalyst that said, TV may not be my path? Um, so one thing is there was never really a lot of money in TV for this kind of genre for, for magic. So even the, the top names in magic, you know, like you'll be surprised how little they might take in. And so it has, uh, most of these, these magicians on TV, they have to have their live venues, which by the way, no longer exist, like as we, as we move into this pandemic. So 
Um, so financially, it was never really interesting. And then it was also, it had this kind of taste to it. It was so much about, you know, kind of trying to be more famous than you are or kind of making it so much about yourself. Um, and it's, yeah, and you know, another thing I might want to want to touch on is magicians have a, you know, it's, it's, it's really a joyful thing to, to bring magic to people, but at the same time, you're never really with the people. You're always in this separate reality. Like you fool people, you trick people. You're always on this other level. You're like looking for ins and ways to exploit the situation. And the conversations you have after you work is always the same, the exact same conversation, which is, how did you do it? Like, and you can never tell. It's always, and so that was just, at, at some point, it just got old for me. It was just like, that was, it didn't feel right anymore. I was really looking for opportunities where I could contribute to something else and maybe be part of something bigger than just a, a career of a magician. And in a way, right now, I'm totally blessed with these kind of opportunities like how cool to be part of space exploration even if i'm just a little part of that right and i do want to go there but not yet because if you <laughs> okay. think about the magician world what are your chances of becoming the next david blaine otherwise you generally would wind up in some type of casino as one of the shows because there really wasn't a clear path we we see only a handful of magicians that really have made it, and, and, and it's really the 1% of the 1%, isn't it true? Yeah, you could say that. It's like, it's, it's, it's very thinned out on the top, and then what we perceive as the top might not just be the thing which feels the best, right? I could imagine that a, you know, a birthday magician who loves his job and is nice to his audience will have a happier life than somebody who's constantly struggling to be this most famous magician in the world, right? And you know, protecting that space and suing other people for stealing his work or, you know, so. Um, but stealing your work is an important thing too, because you found a couple of revenue sources. One was you created your own IP. Yeah, you could, you could say that, but then again, I, um, once I had my own IP, I started giving it away. So I, 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 contributed and, and took heavily from the open source community. So in the kind of things I do and I work with robotics and AR and VR and gestural sensing and AI, uh, if you're not part of a really big company, the, the best way to go about that is to reach out into the open source community and kind of have a, a culture of sharing and collaborating and giving credit to people. And the, the same things we do at Metal, right? Kind of like you, you bring in people, you make sure you treat them right, you give them respect and credit and compensation. And so and that works really well in the open source community and it, it gets you really, really far. But like sticking to your IP and making people sign NDAs before they can even talk about a project is typically not the best way to attract uh, incredible talent. No, but you did have, and I remember, again, since I do remember the things we've done together, the twins. <laughs> yeah. So once in a while, somebody just oversteps way too far. There was, there was this duo which verbatim copied everything I did, like one to one. Like the video was cut the same way, like all the illusion. So we we frightened them a little bit. We went after them with a mean letter, but like that's. I will probably not do that anymore these days. No, but you literally saw your IP stolen. Now, yeah. the first stuff's different, totally different. No, because I'm, I want you to think about as a magician, as any one of our jobs, we always try to look for multiple revenue streams. One is performances. The next one was this whole idea of speaking, not just performing, but doing speaking gigs. You and I met in Korea because we flew you out there. You, we paid you, I think we paid you pretty well. And you were a performer, not just a speaker slash performer. And then you came up with your own tricks. You uh, did television content. So you had probably five different revenue sources. But to maintain the speaker one, which you really liked, because that paid pretty well, and it positioned you in a, in a community that made you look really good, you would have to literally hit the elite side of everything. You have to be at Davos. You would have to be at the... Uh, the MIT Media Lab, you would have to be speaking at TED, you would have to hit the cream of the crop 
just so you could get recognized as a coveted speaker in your space. Yeah, and all of that really came about kind of very fluidly, right? Kind of, it was not like that, uh, again, it was not like, like planning, okay, how do I get into that? How could I, you know, kind of monetize that and get like, it was just being nice and open for opportunities. And if you get the opportunity, make it count, like, like you know, put in the work, you know, make every second of it count. And along the way, stay nice and, you know, don't be stuck up about it. Well, so well, I think that's kind of in, that's what attracts this kind of opportunities, I would imagine. Well, that is, establishes your brand more than just being a magician. Let's talk about your first TED talk, real TED. We're not talking about TEDx, but your first real TED talk. And how long did it take for you to prepare, perform? Yeah, so I was super attracted to TED. Like I, I felt this could be my audience. Like I do this technology design entertainment uh, mix so when ted announced their uh, tedx program uh, i heard that the first event would be in japan and i immediately wrote to them and said hey i travel there i'd love to you know try this out and that actually led to uh, then being invited to like the the real ted because that worked out really well i did one of my kind of signature pieces doing augmented reality and card magic in a kind of nice mix. And so that got me into the family there. And then of course, when it was like the, at TED, they send you this, this uh, stone plate with the TED commandments on it, right? It's like a, a heavy package arrives, which uh, you, you shall not steal the time of the person who comes after you. You shall not sell from the stage. And so like, uh, when that thing started and like, and I felt the professionalism of that organization and that organization is real after like 33 plus years now, they really know how to do conferences and how to make speakers look good. So that was kind of an extra kick to say, okay, now, now I really have to put in work and, and make it count. So I had like four months to prepare and I think I used the whole four months just to, just to, uh, to get it right. Yeah, well, be let's, let's be realistic. I remember when you would call me and it would be at a, a crazy ass hour, be like maybe 10 or 11 o'clock your time on the East Coast. And you would be practicing months ahead, but every night you would do it three or four or five times, the same thing over and over again. Because yeah. you said <laughs> practice is make perfect. Practice makes it look like it's the first time. And that was the key. I think and so. that's what I need. So I'm not an... As you can tell, I'm stumbling through this conversation. I'm not a naturally kind of super articulated speaker. And so practicing and preparing well gives me comfort. So then it feels to me like it's, it's the first time. It just feels like I can, I can go with the flow. But for that, I need to prepare every time. Yeah. Well, it would take you months to just do something that would last how many minutes on stage? Like six minutes or eight minutes. Yeah. And how many TED Talks? Seven. <laughs> Those are TED Talks, everyone, not TEDx. I got to stress that. I mean, I think um, um, Sir Ken, who just died, I think eclipsed you with 10 talks. You are the second most, you're the, you spoke on TED the second most than anyone else. That's pretty amazing. Sir Ken, uh, Kenneth Robert, Robertson? Ken Robert. Robinson, yeah. Yeah, he's, 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 he spoke the most. And you're number two. You don't get paid from this, but it's for notoriety, right? Yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, there's so many benefits to having, having these kind of platforms, right? So on one side, it's the publicity and that people want to book you after as a speaker. But then also being exposed to that network of talent, which is very similar to metal. You have like just these incredible people which you can meet and you possibly can collaborate. Like, and so I met a lot of my heroes at TED events, kind of like, and, uh, and were able, was able to create kind of relationships and collaborations. Yeah. So, I, by the way, doesn't it look like Chesney's like in a calendar, like a pin up calendar right now? Chesney's just laying there, a little <laughs> summer day. You should yeah. put it. Now, uh, <laughs> random Thursday. <laughs> if you want to take a snapshot and, and put it on your wall, Ken, you just go. I, I wouldn't put it in my wall. I would keep it closer than that. Just let you know, on a lonely night, I would pull up the little 
Ches <laughs> but hey, Chesney's a great example, Marco. Chesney is a, an artist, a performer. He's performed in front of tens of thousands of people. Um, matter of fact, the idea of performing is something that was, I would say, Chesney, you're a natural performer. Marco, were you a natural performer? Nah, no. I'm, no, my talent is kind of, it's very Swiss, like tenacity, perseverance, like, you know, getting up early and starting to work. <laughs> yeah, it, but I mean, a lot can be achieved with that, right? Kind of, and so on, the longer you do it. I think kind of talent is a muscle, kind of like the more you train it, the better you get at it. So true. But I, I want, I'm happy Chesney's here. Chesney, I'm really happy to see you, by the way. Because good to see you too, mate. Chesney is kind of like you, Marco, where you had that switch from becoming a magician turned into now, I, I don't even know what they call you at Accenture or at JPL. You, you've created your own titles, but you've used all this back experience to create your new title moving forward. Chesney is a, a, a songwriter, a performer, an artist, personality. He can almost, he's got all the right components to transform that into something like you have. So what do you call yourself today? What is your title today in both of those places? Is it radically different or is it the same? Myself? Yes. At, well, at JPL, I'm a creative technologist, right? So, you know, I cannot be a magician. Like if that shows up in a, in a budget, <laughs> it's not going to work with the public. And at Accenture, I'm... Um, an essential luminary. I'm part of the luminary program and then I'm the extended reality lead consultant. So, I mean, these are just titles. <laughs> and, and did they look at your educational background or did they look at your experience background? Yeah, so with, with, with NASA, with the government, they, they look a little more than Accenture. They also look kind of like who you worked for, what kind of companies you worked for, how much you made, like, uh, so it's kind of a little bit more of a check before you become a contractor there. And with Accenture, it was important for them to know kind of the affiliations I think are interesting for them, that I did them a MIT Media Lab Director's Fellow, or you know, for them it's, it's great that I have TED Talks and so on, and that I'm in Davos and so. Um, it's almost I think like it's, you know, I, I, you know I, I would, I, I imagine that this is, while this is kind of unusual right now that this kind of engineering and liberal arts come closer together and that big organizations find find use for that to have somebody in the loop who's maybe a user experience guy you could say magic is user experience in one way or another like to have somebody like that a, a pragmatic robust like user experience uh, expert you know magic tricks can never fail right so if you have these kind of principles in products they might work better so to have these these organizations which which hire these kind of people and bring that in earlier in the process um i think is, is a very modern thing and also to have this kind of part-time leadership that you have a contractor but the contractor can actually be technically a managing director like uh, that that's a new thing but i think we're going to see more and more of that so what these guys here and i know like harry and howard chesney probably michael everyone's trying to reimagine themselves almost like hey it's time to rebirth the new me how do you go through that process of using all the past experience to see what we're going to be moving forward um, that's a really difficult question. <laughs> I'm, I'm, for me, for myself, um, things really started happening. And I mentioned that a little before when I stopped pushing all that hard, when I just didn't want in here specifically or there specifically, where I was, um, it also had to do with generosity, I think, like to be, to be really open to do stuff and kind of to, to put myself out there in, into new situations. You know, I n not just did that. When I wanted to start speaking, I spoke everywhere. Like I would go to, to a school and talk in front of a class. Like I would, I would take 
like a Skype meeting with with a, with a class of 12 year olds and will prepare the same kind of way I would for a big corporate gig. So I think um, for me, it really works to, I don't know, it's, 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 it sounds hokey, but kind of to genuinely kind of be a little bit more myself and not so much like the magician on the photo they saw with the wind machine and the, <laughs> all of that. That just, when I, when I changed that, everything came together. But that was also in a time where um, things were not as different as they are right now, right? Right now we have, I mean, like for life entertainment or for speaking gigs, like nothing is happening. Like the, the really big entertainment companies go out of business, like Cirque du Soleil or Life Nation or like one after the other is folding. Like Disney is <laughs> like 30,000 people laid off, you know, the parks are closed probably forever pretty soon so it's a, it's a whole other ball game for for that circuit for for being a speaker and doing high paid corporate gigs like so true let's go to a question ck go for it hey marco really appreciate your uh, philosophy about you know following flow and being naturalistic about you know where everything's happening but the question i have is a little bit more tactical here is you're a master of audience engagement and whether it's virtual or physical. Um, from your perspective, knowing what you know now as a master, as a black belt, uh, what would you say the fundamental skills of audience engagement, whether it be virtual, or whether it be physical, user experience? So, yeah, so for me, like the, the guiding principle is kind of be nice to your audience, make every second count, you know, be really well prepared. Um, and, and, and be yourself, you know, like, I think uh, audiences can feel that. Like, so if you talk to an audience, they can just feel that you're, if you're a nice person, if they don't, if they decide they don't want to spend time with you after 20 seconds, then it's kind of over. Right. So, um, yeah. And yeah, I, I wouldn't know what, what, what else to say. Well, kind of, that's, that, would, that would be good enough. Yeah. So as you look at all these things, let me go over to here. I am not going to share this yet. I'm going to do something cool. Uh, let me go over to Harry, who's got that damn good lens right there. Go for it, Harry. Your question for Marco. Hey, Marco. Um, I got a question for you. You mentioned IP early on in this conversation. And for years, I wondered about TED conferences. And I see this happening metal. I thought somebody should come up with a TED do because I understand they don't want you selling from the stage. Uh, and there's a saying that the entrepreneur isn't going to show up at your town hall because he's not going to give away where he thinks the next opportunity is coming from. You know, it's like one man's intellectual property is another man's gift to society. Uh, did your relationships at TED manifest into, you know, concrete, uh, you know, processes or relationships? that you were then able to monetize? Um. Yeah, so, you know, the not selling from the stage, like to touch on that really quickly, it's like, you're assume, it's assumed that you belong there when you're invited. So there's no need to, to talk about your latest book or to <laughs> kind of quote your book so people buy the book. It's just, it just feels inappropriate. Um, so, and in respect to collaboration, so, I had um, incredible introductions made through, through TED. So I think being at JPL is a, is a direct connection from, from TED. Being invited to Davos was a TED thing. Um, CNN did a special about me. They did like a 50 minute program because of somebody I met at TED and then bumped into again at, at, uh, in Davos. That was Sanjay um, Gupta who did that interview, by the way. Yeah, that was that was you know was amazing opportunities. Currently, there's somebody who's uh, introduced me to somebody for a book deal, and so um, um, it's 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 a friendly community. It's not like metal, right? It's not that you know close knit kind of really taking care of each other, but uh, people tend to be super nice there, and so it's a, it's a good place to. Guys, been I, want to to somebody. Somebody. I want to give you an idea. Let's see if this works. 
I want you to see, can you guys all see this? Can you hear this? Capture system, which are these cameras up here. Oh yeah. Can tell each of the drones where exactly they. they I just want you are. to. I want you to see what his laboratory would look like. <laughs> this is Marco's laboratory in New York, but just to get an idea of. But then we have another model, which is this model, which doesn't need any motion capture. This uses an ultra wideband positioning system. This will be for a stadium where you want to go into larger spaces, maybe two, three hundred yards. Look at this. I want you just to see how organized. In camera. And that camera seems to end over here at the Magic Lab. Yeah, so this is the kind of setup which is used to create these kind of choreographies. We're using a, a video game engine. We use Unity to actually... Oh, okay. Uh, to actually what video oh. is that? <laughs> this is a video. I, I, I do want to show this. The, the because... behavior, so the, the, the physics of... Is that you? That's me. That's, that's Yeah, a, that's a the, the drone of... choreography system. Where yeah, that's right. And I'm, I'm going to show a video. When you say the word... That. Because I think... That there, as I go through all these videos I have of Marco, <laughs> I have a lot. I want you guys to see what Marco does here with this video. Now he did feature this on the machines to fly close formation, aware of each other, aware of me. Mathematics that can be mistaken for intelligence. Now it's hard to hear what's going on here, but what's really interesting is how Marco uses certain things that I think are amazing. They're triggers. And one of the triggers he uses is music. So music is a trigger mechanism for Marco to understand positioning, pause, and placement. And that's how he knows what's going to happen because those, those music notes, and he's been doing it forever. I, Marco, I watched you do it even with the, uh, uh, the whiteboard. You would have music in the background because you knew exactly where your timing was based upon the music. But that's something that I don't see all that often, how music is used as a timing mechanism. Right, so um, I mean, it's all about managing attention, right? Now, especially, right, when we are, when we are sitting in Zoom calls or WebEx calls, like, you know, if so if you're a speaker and you can like kind of break the frame or take a camera and, and walk, out, walk out into another room. In my talks, I, I walk down to my living room and I fly a swarm of drones on a Zoom call and I come back up here and the latest thing I'm working on these days is, uh, maybe I can pull this up really quickly, I can show you this. It's gonna just take a minute. So I'm, wor I'm trying to figure out what would be cool technologies to use at home to, um, to improve um, or, or to, to get more attention when you're in these kind of meetings. So this is a, just a quick test. Um, I created a robotic arm. Let me shrink myself a little bit. What are you using as your tool to do this now? It's called mm -hmm. It's a. Uh, it's are you using, uh, are you using mm -hmm? I yeah. have it installed. Okay. I have tried it. I got a beta tag. So you like so, it? Yeah. So this moving camera here is a robotic arm, which. Uh, which I'm gonna set up, I look very serious here. So this is just a very early test. So I'm creating this robotic arm. This is uh, how the operations look like. So, so this will be my webcasting software. And um, so I have a robotic camera on a, on a, on a, like an iPhone camera or a robotic camera on, on, the, on, the, on this arm. And so in a, in a live webcast, kind of like the, the camera can move around or if I wanna show something on my hand, the camera go on my hand. So. That's the thing I'm currently playing with. And I'm also playing with a drone which can follow me around in a, let me make myself big again. Um, I'm also working on a drone which can fly around and follow me around in my apartment when I do kind of little walkthroughs of my lab, which is in the basement. So I'm always looking for these kind of things which could capture, capture the attention. Of course, music and, interesting backgrounds and you know and computer animations and whatnot all of these i know you things. want to show us some oh. stuff i can just tell you're ready to go <laughs> go ahead pull it out and press this marco yeah i'm just see like i don't have you see i didn't know what this was today I know <laughs> otherwise i would have prepared <laughs> do something come on it's like when someone says oh you're a magician great do a trick for me it's like what no where, where someone like Chesney could just pull out a guitar and start singing a song, right? Being a magician is a little different than that. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm not going to impress, I think, today. There's really nothing cool on my, 
I'm just pulling stuff in from my desktop here. So actually there's one more thing I could show. Have you guys seen this, these companies which are surfacing right now, which make synthetic media where you can just upload a script or you just type in and like a minute later you get a video file of somebody oh. speaking that. Let oh. me quickly try to set that up. I want to show you a sample. I thought that would be so cool to use in talks. Hey, by the way, Howard, uh, the North Pole's calling and they would love for you to fill in because by that time, your beard's going to be long enough to be sent. Hey, okay, here it is. Watch this. Hello. Can you hear I'm the I'm a audio? synthetic AI presenter. I, I can, can professionally, professionally present, present your script and I can speak and translate it into many different languages. You simply provide text and receive your processed video within minutes. Imagine being able to create video content at scale with a synthetic, synthetic presenter that, that looks exactly like you crazy, with the yeah. flexibility of changing the content so in a text box with consistent you get a video quality. back. It's synthetic me. I going to use that. Hello. In, like, so this is kind of I'm a, a synthetic AI presenter. I, I can professionally present your script and I can speak and translate it into Very many cool different tech. languages. You simply provide text and receive your processed video within minutes. So Imagine being able to create it has yeah. you and your girlfriend were two of those. So you're providing it with the imagery and it Yeah, they give you a, they give you a script. You read it. It's like a five minute script. You upload that video and they make an avatar of you. And now that avatar is online and you can access it through a web interface or you can access it through an API and you can just inject what you want as media back. I think this is, it's going to be pretty big this kind of synthetic media like customized news shows like you know the newscaster will say your name it's going to arrive in the inbox every every morning or you have an after sales video your car dealership there's a young woman saying hey ken thank you so much for getting your tesla today you know kind of like that kind of stuff is pretty magical okay i got a cool one for you can you pull up a browser yeah by the way tell everybody what kind of connectivity you have and how much you're paying for it I have uh, 10 gigabit and I pay and I pay like 50 bucks. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Pull up a browser and I want you to type in this person does not exist.com. Oh, have you seen this before? Content no. at scale with, with a, a synthetic, synthetic presenter, presenter that, that looks like that. That's that. This person does not exist.com. Oh, okay. So. This person does not exist.com. So check out what this does. This is crazy. Oh, yeah. And just refresh it. Every time you refresh it, it creates a, a person that literally does not exist by utilizing all these components that it finds externally. How crazy is that? Very cool. Not one of these individuals is real. So it's using AI to create all these images. So you could theoretically go off and take one of these, put it inside your synthetic, and they can be an, 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 an avatar for you, couldn't they? Yeah, let me refresh one more time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're a funny man. Uh -huh. but, uh -huh. but, but where are we at right now? As you watch technology, Marco, you have to be loving where we're at. Because things are changing so radically, it's it's insane how fast it's moving. Yeah, it's I mean, it's like the opportunities are incredible, and also like for the for the first time in a long time, I'm always home, so I have I have a little bit of time to uh, to play with new stuff and 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 kind of seek out these companies. How do how do we find out where that synthetic synthetic website is? Uh, let me pull up the website and and post the link. No, Marco, if you want to play with it, it's very inexpensive too. And, and you've been playing, of course, in the drone space for a long time. What's your thought on where drones are going? Um, I'm kind of um, I'm kind of done with the drones. I think what's going to happen next is going to be quadrupeds, right? So, so. So the four-legged robots is go are going to be the next drones, I think. I think there's going to be a democratization of that space. 
So the price has come down. It's no longer going to be $70,000 for a spot from Boston Dynamics. It's going to be like $5,000 or $8,000 from a robot dog from a Chinese company like DJI. And then all the innovation will happen in the, in the software space. So and you got I, to play with the spot for a while, didn't you? Yeah, and also right now, actually, I have, I have a, a small robot dog, which I'm, I'm playing with these days. So I'm kind of, it's not really ready, but uh, um, I think that robots is going to be, it's going to be a big topic, like robots uh, beyond drones, like robots in our spaces, like, and beyond uh, kind of teach and repeat, really, really kind of autonomous robots, which can do tasks and which are like, fun. Like what? I see the, the practical sides of a drone just for imagery and telemetry what would mm -hmm. you do a four-legged quadruped for um in um, unattended inspection like in industry it would be like you would have it an, uh, an oil rig it could walk around and look at temperature gauges and things like that and kind of do like an inspection a repeat inspection could walk uh, a construction site and see if everything is, is is on spec with the plans like do a laser scan and compare it to the to the data of the architectural office um, and like uh, search and rescue operations things like that and then the compliant robot arms. So there are robot arms right now on the market, which are super quick, but they cannot hurt you. They are, they're compliant. So they, they have like torque sensing. So if they have a collision with you, they stop. And so there are interesting use cases. I'm working on this. I can show you this quickly. This is something I work on for Accenture, which is, um, is By the way, using... I, I, I uh, trademark that, CK. The next is, is uh, a trademark of mine. That's what I call myself. Okay, so this is a, a robot which, so this is just a, a VR simulation, but it provides feedback when you're in virtual reality. So you touch things which you see in virtual reality. So in virtual reality, this would look like this. So this is the view of the user. He here operates a, an interface and clicks on things and plays with bar charts in 3D. and. On the out, if you see that from the outside, it looks like this. So he he essentially touches thing in midair, and the things are there because that robotic arm moves in place just in time. So that's the that's the kind of the concept of this. This is kind of something I'm working on. It's I just like, don't understand because that's going to be an expensive thing to have. Uh, this arm is like ten thousand euro, right? So. Well, and that would be it's not exactly consumer but it's uh it's going to be fantastic for let's say financial services you want to manipulate inputs and outputs of, of go beyond bar charts right kind of really go uh, full on 3d with haptics or, or or learning things which use spatial memory or muscle memory you kind of like you can learn stuff and touch things it's uh i think it's going to be uh, a big thing like, and it certainly is magical to see it. So I don't have this in the real world yet. I'm just playing with it in a, in virtual reality currently, but maybe in a month or two, I'm going to have a setup where we can actually try this. What's your thought about that VR headset? You know, the Oculus, the Samsung, you know, where, where do you think, I think it's going? I think uh, in infliction point right now with the Oculus Quest 2, like 299 for a mobile headset, which is, a pretty nice experience for a consumer. It's like, uh, I think it's at this point now where there's no reason not to try this out and play. And, and, and the content is pretty good. Yeah, but it does give you fatigue after a while. Yeah, it's not for all day use. It's not like you know, William Gibson novel, but to play, like people use it for fitness and they have a lot of fun. They use it for 30 minutes a day, 40 minutes a day. It's like, yeah, I know we do a lot of, we do a lot of these uh, virtual events where we ship out these headsets to, um, to uh, like VIPs, to like top clients and they put them on and they're, and then we meet them inside virtual reality. You know, Marco, you also were a big fan of AR. Uh, you were with first with the HoloLens. Mm -hmm. uh, you and Microsoft were working on all kinds of things. What's your thought on the mixed reality front where AR and VR finally will somehow come together? 
I think it will need another generation of devices, right? So currently, like the the Hololens two is very very expensive. It's almost five thousand dollars if you want to use it. So it's really enterprise. But we need these headsets like the Oculus Quest, but with a cam with cameras in it, so you can see through and do the AR part, and then you can close it out and be fully in VR. That's like I don't know, eighteen months away, two years away. So, Apple, Apple's but all this stuff is like there's an acceleration right now. We're all stuck at home. All the companies are really, the big companies are really worried about multiple overlapping pandemics, possible not being able to return to your workspace anymore. People are missing the spaces they worked in. They miss meeting each other in these spaces, and so virtual reality gets this push right now where so many companies start playing yeah. and 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 experimenting with this and kind of incubating new ideas and new and new ways to do that it, it's kind of like what we saw with zoom right zoom was there and it just got pushed to the forefront because of all this and you think that the vr ar spaces should and will take advantage of the pandemic to become more push forward i think so absolutely and i mean there's we, I hardly have a day at Accenture where I don't have like two, three demos to really big companies who see what we do with with uh, virtual collaboration, immersive collaboration platforms. And everybody's like, oh, you know, we want this. We need our showroom in virtual reality or we need to meet and do design thinking together or we need this to onboard people so they can learn about the building which they might visit in, in, in half a year from now. Well, how so. about the virtual space itself? How do you see that changing? Because if we're not, I, I just read that New York right now has 10% occupancy of people going to the office, just 10%. They're going into shutdown. They probably don't see normality maybe till May or June, possibly some type of new normal to May or June of next year, possibly. So if New York's going to that, other parts of the world are too. What's yeah, the I don't think it's going to come back. I mean, if you talk about commercial real estate, that's like, <laughs> I wouldn't want to be in that business right now. I think yeah, yeah, but, but most tell us people, the most, hmm? but how about the collaborative space? How does that going to look, the virtual collaborative space in your mind? Right, so I think there's going to be tools to do this. I mean, there are already tools, you know, not everything needs to be in 3D. I think a lot of people use Mural and, and tools like that to do their design thinking and their collaboration. I think what not so many people have thought about yet or not so many organizations have thought about yet is the kind of the importance of the physical spaces and the, the meaning of these physical spaces. So, so a lot of companies have super iconic place like JPL. It's like an iconic place. You have a feeling when you go there every day and you don't have that feeling when you work for JPL from home. So how do you make up for that cultural loss and how big is that? What's the impact on, of that for your innovation or for yeah, your you know, you like kind of... How do you simulate or emulate that? Yeah, um, I think it's a, it's a good time to experiment, right? To, to figure out like what kind of spaces and what kind of, how do we represent people in virtual reality? Do we need avatars? Does everybody look the same? Do you dress up like a fantasy uh, character every time? Or do you just upload a photo and that creates an avatar of you? Um, you know, are these places persistent? Like when, when we leave a Zoom call, the chat is gone. Everything we did is gone. There's no way to ever be overheard. There's no way to like, you know, step to the water cooler and have a conversation. Like how do we create all these mechanisms in, 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 in these virtual spaces? That's going to be a super interesting problem to solve. And that will bring me back to what I talked about when I said bringing in liberal art is these are not engineering problems. These are all liberal arts and design and user experience problems, right? These are, these are the kind of things we're all good at if they let us like, so it's very interesting space we're suddenly in. And, and what do you see Marco people coming into your world now? What are they graduating with in school or what type of background are they having that is impressing you? Um, do you mean like for hiring people? What yeah, do I look yeah, for? Or? Yeah, and Accenture. What are you looking for? What excites you? What are they coming out? What are they doing? Right. Do they even well, I look, so for my own hires, I look for people who are 
who do what they do at work as a hobby as well. Like something like, I love people who say, I, I love to work for you, but I'm creating this game and I need, and I can only work 70% or 60%, right? So I know they're going to be on the latest and greatest and they have the kind of stamina and, 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 and passion to, to learn new things and be curious. So I look for, in that sense, I look for like, soft skills maybe more than hard skills like people who are nice and who, lo who love new things and are not afraid to learn stuff and not so much are you a five-year or seven-year or 12-year senior you know software engine like that doesn't count anymore stuff is changing so quickly like if you don't love change you're you know there's no space right now right. In, in the, let's go to alan uh, alan question for marco yes do you know of an app that can send the your smartphone screen when you're videoing or shooting outdoors in the sunshine, you can't see the screen. If there was an app that could send it to your glasses you could put on so that you could not just be guessing if you're focusing or shooting accurately. Yeah, that would require a pair, you know, an extra piece of hardware, right? So, and I think that's the conundrum, like kind of like, Right now, all these companies, and I think probably the reason we don't see an Apple Glass yet is that we have not figured out what is so cool to do with those that you cannot already do with this, right? It's this kind of, you know, what is makes it worth your while to leave this at home or to charge another device which you always have with you, right? Kind of like they manage this somehow with the Apple Watch, but with, with a wearable device on your face, it's, it's really hard to come up with a good use case. So in, in augmented reality, I know like two good use cases from all the use cases, which are make so much sense that you cannot do it without it. And, you know, and so one of them is a JPL, a JPL thing where, where the Mars rover sends back images every day from Mars and they get stitched together into a topological map and then every day before breakfast, a bunch of scientists wear hololenses and walk around on Mars and look at that new terrain. So it's a virtual field trip to Mars one-to-one -one, and they can look at stuff and say, oh, this is a water crack, we should send back a robot. And this you could not do with any other technology. And so it makes total sense. And it's just a great, great use case. But I mean, like holding up your phone and I don't know, putting a Pokemon on the floor and then, <laughs> That's fun for a little bit, but it's not that, it's not that, right? Yeah, but it does inspire. So exactly that. It inspires someone to say, yeah, I could see that mixed reality world. And now I want to take it to another world. But you have to have those little nuggets of fun at the very beginning, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But then you also have to, I mean, it's like, the, the thing you mentioned right away, you said, well, yeah, but this virtual reality, he said, oh, you're going to get nauseous or it's not for all day use, right? Kind of so, no, so no, what I is the it. cool thing you would only do half an hour a day, but you would, but you cannot do it any other way, right? Where you do this. Like, I get it. But let me just tell you, Marco, you'd appreciate this. So I was sitting with a bunch of uh, hedge fund guys that invest in technologies and they have an entire area inside their fund called frames. Okay. They invest in so it's exactly what your glasses are, but what those next generation frames are going to be. And they expect that this is a multi-billion dollar industry is the next iteration of frames. If it's going to project onto your eye or you're going to see it through the frames or, but that's the next space, right? Is taking what we feel comfortable with and augmenting that. Yeah. I mean, it's, I think there's also kind of a perception gap, which holds this back a little bit. So on, what I mean by that is like, we have seen these glasses already. We've seen them in sci-fi movies, right? And we see them in concept studies. And it's the same with robots. We saw all these robots, which just walk to the fridge and get you a Coke and cook your pizza. And, like, and all these things are impossible today. You cannot do that. There is no robot which can autonomously in unknown terrain, go, just walk to your fridge and get you a Coke in a meaningful amount of time, right? And so whatever that product is in that space, the, it doesn't, it will not feel new to us. It will feel like it's not actually doing what we would expect it to do. Like if the Apple glasses will not have a field of view like this, 
and will just be like the HoloLens with a little glowing square in front of you. Nobody's going to like that. So in that sense, that reality gap, that kind of what's possible and what we think is possible, is uh, that's very hard to bridge if you want to bring out the new product. I mean, the, the HoloLens probably cost like, 1.5 billion dollars to make, right? The Oculus Quest probably cost twice that much. There are thousands of people working on these products and the result is something we would say, yeah, but it's not that comfortable. You don't want to wear it more than 20 no, minutes. Let's go to Chesney, Chesney. Oh, hey, Marco. How are you, mate? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I saw you on a... Um, on a metal event uh, maybe a year ago and just f completely i'm such a big fan of yours <laughs> and, and oh, uh, thank you well because because i'm in the uh, uh entertainment business you know i'm a musician and it's kind of really uh how i perform to my uh fans and uh and i've been doing a lot of online events and stuff like that and of course when i saw you do your amazing magic trickery uh, all on zoom i was like oh my god i want to do that in my shows obviously, obviously i don't have anything like what you have i just wondered what you thought about um the future now of of live mm -hmm. music uh, via via virtual worlds because i can imagine uh you know as you said all of all of these iconic venues closing and and uh i don't have a I have one gig in uh, in March that's in, which probably is in the book, which should probably be cancelled. Um, so and that be a year to the day when I've last on a on a stage. Wow! Um, I can imagine that this is n there's no real end in sight to 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 this pandemic <laughs> and the the destruction to my business. Um, and I I guess what my question is, I because you know, I can imagine you being very much involved in in this world is it how do you think people like me and and mm -hmm. you know, can perform to people in a virtual world um you know in, in, a, in a in a good way because, you know we're able to have the quality of audio and visual that will it's, it's always a hard thing to to to, to establish you know how, how would you do it <laughs> You right, so I think that, you know, by not, well, I by like Live Live Nation or something came to you and said, right, Marco, create us the perfect way for for artists to uh, to do gigs in a virtual world. Right, I think you have a like for the first time in a long time, you have an advantage now to, uh, over companies like Night Live Nation or you know Cirque du Soleil or like the really big entertainment companies, and I think. If you can be nimble with your, you know, with your setup and with your reach, if you can say, okay, I'm comfortable playing for in venues with a hundred people or 150 people. And I'm, you know, I travel in a van. I gonna, it's going to be within driving distance. So I don't have to quarantine. I can set up, I have a following, which is big enough to, to set up a gig for next week or, you know, so I think there's there's a fair amount of money on the table for that. Like right now, people will be craving live events and to do them safely, you have to figure out like it has to be small venues where people can, can kind of separate. It cannot be a big overhead in promotion. So I would use the virtual space to promote my venues and then and then find just the right mix so it's profitable enough. Like, you know, if like, if like 200 people give you 30 bucks, right? And you, and like, that's not so bad if you can do a few of these a week, right? And yeah, I mean, there's so I think, I think there's a, there's quite an opportunity right now because the big stadiums, um, they cannot, you know, it's not gonna work for them. It's never, it's that's impossible. not gonna happen. I, I think the, the physical space um, situation with you know get crowd gatherings is not really going to happen uh, and be for a while for a long time which is why I was interested in obviously I'm looking to to now you know go go digital and 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 be online and and interact with my with the people that are interested in coming to see me in that way but I, I want to do it in an interesting way you know it's like I've been doing it via zoom uh, and you know using OBS <laughs> and you know maybe a couple of cameras and bringing in people and, uh, and doing, I feel like 
I, I've gone as far as I can technically, you know, because I'm not like you yep. uh, in that space. But I want to be able to to to, to make it more more of a show. If you know what I mean? That's uh, more interesting. I would Im I would imagine there are plenty of um, companies which are kind of in the in the same space you are right now, which could which you could partner with, like companies which have diminished revenue streams, like live entertainment companies, which are now struggling, trying to figure out how to go into streaming. And mm -hmm. the kind of the ugly truth is that these virtual events are not very well attended, right? Kind of, it's very hard to make money with it. Like, People cannot. And the only one that's really nobody knows job. how to grab the, the attention. So the one that's done a great job is Tony Robbins. Tony really has knocked it out of the park. Have you seen set up? I haven't. Oh, so you want to go type in, go to Tony Robbins Instagram and see what he did. It's mind blowing. And let me just do this before we run out of time. Uh, and I think Chesney started the conversation. Marco, I want to end it with this. Where do you see the future of virtual events platforms like? Is Zoom all we got, or do you see newer things coming out that blow us away more than what Zoom is? Oh, no, like the space is heating up completely, right? Kind of like there's going to be a lot of innovation in this space. So I'm currently building a virtual set with tracked cameras in my basement. So in about two weeks, I'm going to have this big green screen where I can, I can be on Mars. I can be anywhere in the, you know, like in this 3D environment. And I'm not the only one. So there's, there's a company it's called Touchcast. They create these virtual venues where they, they get you in into, you dial in from Zoom and they put you on a stage. So it looks like you're behind a lectern on a stage and in front of you is like Madison Square Garden with people waving and like 3D animated cameras. And so I think there's going to be a lot of vendors. So, you know, there's going to be a really big ecosystem of, 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 of different type of solutions. And for the next you know, 18 months or so, there's gonna be cool new stuff all the time. It, I think, think all players- Can like I come and do a gig songs? in your house, uh, yeah, Marco? Can I come and do a gig in your space? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> got a cool place in Zurich. Hey, uh, Marco, the old school players, the Microsoft, the Apples, would they be playing in this space? Would they still be leaders or is it gonna come out of left field, things we didn't expect? I think what they're going to do is they're going to try out all these vendors and try them at their events because they need to run events as well. And if they see something which plugs way with, uh, well with what they are doing, they're going to they're gonna acquire these companies. So they have Old Space VR, which is kind of a social VR events platform. You know, if they have a better vendor which helps them out, they're going to they're gonna snatch them up. So... I think there's going to be a lot of acquisitions by the big companies. Everybody wants to be in this space now. And in the same way, these tools will get better. Like you know, Teams now tries to be Zoom and Zoom will up Teams and WebEx is doing new stuff. And so that's going to be all good for us. Like it's going to be, there's going to be cool new stuff soon. Marco, uh, Dankeschön, thank you so much for giving us this time and just being like out of nowhere doing this. This is great. Uh, do me a favor. I'm going to call you right back in about 30 seconds. So don't go away. Everyone, <laughs> unmute yourself and thank Marco. Everybody hey, thanks, Marco. Thank, hey, Marco. thank you very much for thank hanging you out. Thank you, Marco. It was great. Thank you.